Welcome to another episode of Wellness Curated. This is your host, Anshu Bahanda, and as you know, the aim of this podcast is to get you tools, techniques, uh, approaches, ideas that will help you to lead a healthier, happier, more hopeful life. This season, we're focusing on financial well-being, and the subject of today's discussion is psychology of spending. So we have a very special guest today. We have Luis Miranda. He's chairman of the Center for Civic Society and CORO. He's founder director of the Indian School of Public Policy, and he's played a key role in establishing two renowned companies, the HDFC Bank and I- IDFC Private Equity. Welcome to the chat, Lewis, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you, Anshu. And for the record, I have subscribed to both your YouTube channel and to your podcast. Oh, fabulous. And I, I, I'm sure you'll encourage lots of people to do that. Um, so, Lewis, my first question to you is, you know, from the time where you had a salary, when you started your career, to now heading major financial institutions, can you describe to us the evolution of your personal relationship with money and spending? So I'm, I'm sure, you know, I've never been driven by the need to make money. And even when we built those institutions like HDFC Bank, which today is the fourth most valuable bank in the world, or when we started IDFC Private Equity Investing in Infrastructure, it was never about the money. It was always about building a good business. Uh, and, uh, and that's something which has been, uh, you know, driven whatever I've done. It's not that I grew up with a lot of money as kids, etc., but we had enough. And, uh, and you know, and, and, and that's really what, what, what drove us. The fact that money is just a mechanism to be able to survive and go on. But after some stage, what do you do with that extra money? So a few years ago, one of my friends, Amit Chandra, called me up and said, you know, Lewis, we've started this movement called Living My Promise. And uh, would Fiona and you consider pledging half of what you have for charity, either in your life or in your wills? And we said, sure, but we need to talk to our kids because when we are dead, we're gone. But our kids are the ones who are giving it up, actually. And both our kids said, you know, dad and mom, you know, this is your money and we don't need it and you do what you want with it. So, so it, I mean, we're glad we sort of, you know, continue that sort of thought even with our kids. And, uh, and you know, because once you've had the basics, what do you do with the rest of it? We don't spend extravagantly. So money is just a means to get to where you want to be. And interestingly enough, whenever I was working, wherever I was, and if I realized that the only reason to stay on was for the money, that's when I knew I had to leave. Mm-hmm. Very well said, actually. And funnily enough, you know, you said money is just a mechanism. This is my book of affirmations. And I'd opened it today to this, which says money is just an energy and I can attract this energy. Yep. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So, so I want to ask you, when you look back, you know, when you were growing up in your younger days, when you were building your career, do you feel like you should have done things differently? Should your approach to money, to spending have been different? You know, if, if, I, if I look back at what I could have done differently, I think I would have started investing earlier. And that's what, okay. I tell my, and that's what we tell our kids. Start investing. And even with the people I mentor, put aside a small sum of money every month because the power of compounding is a huge lesson, which we, which, uh, well, I studied that in school, but I never appreciated it from a financial perspective. And even now, the other day we were sitting and redoing our wills, and and I was surprised at what we had. And I was telling this to the to our to our trustee, and and he said, you know, Lewis, I'm not surprised, but I said I was surprised because you forget sometimes that's the power of compounding. And so my only advice really to be with to people would be start early, and uh, not sort of wait till uh, you sort of feel that you have enough. Start that habit of putting things early. I've, uh, and, and the second thing is never f- forget that there's a huge amount of luck involved. I strongly believe that I've been lucky. I've been lucky to, to get to where we are financially or professionally or, you know, emotionally. And uh, 
you know, once people believe that they are masters of their destiny, I think that's when they have a challenge. There is a certain amount of randomness also in life that we got to keep in mind there. Okay. And, um, you know, as India is modernizing and with all this digitization happening and fintech happening, you know, have you noticed any unexpected trends in the way people approach their finances and their spending decisions? I think the availability of credit has actually made, uh, made people spend more than they could have. Now, I'm not saying credit is bad. Uh, credit is good. We've, uh, economies have grown on credit. But reckless credit is dangerous especially when you have easy money and you suddenly realize that, you know, I could have, and then you spend on stuff which is not creating assets. So where do we spend our money? My wife and I, Fiona and I just spend our money mainly on education and travel because we believe that travel is also education. We don't spend it on fancy food. We don't spend it on fancy cars, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and that's really where, you know, it's, it's, about creating investments in the future. But if you spend it a lot on stuff that is not in, in what we think is necessary, you then wonder, is that sort of right? So, so the access to credit can be very powerful if used properly, but can be very destructive if used badly. And unfortunately, you're seeing so many people today uh, at all levels who are borrowing and living off credit without any way to repay that yet. So that's something important. And a book that I find very useful is a book written by Morgan Housel, The Psychology of Money. And, and that's a fascinating book, which I think everyone should read here. It's a simple book. It's no math in it. But it really talks about the fact that everyone's personal experience determines how they relate to money. And that's important. Uh, and he talks, for example, about how President Kennedy, when he went through the Great Depression, they actually grew in wealth during the Great Depression. So they, he never knew how much people suffered until he went to college. And then he saw other people suffered. You know, so your personal experience determines your relationship to money. He talk, Morgan talks also about the role of luck uh, in the things that we do and about the need to look at broad patterns as opposed to anecdotal sort of situations over there. So I think that's a fascinating book. Uh, which people should read. Okay. And tell me something. So if you take, say, the developing economies, right? Once you people reach a place of comfort with their lives, then what is it that influences their spending going forward? Is it culture? Because you said one of it is growing up. You know, is it collectivism? Is it just following trends like X has this car, so I want this car? You know, because I'm seeing, I grew up in Delhi. I'm seeing a huge consumerism culture there. So, you know, first of all, let me say there's nothing right or wrong in the way, pe what people do with their money. It's your money. Absolutely. You do what you yes. want to do. I think that's something people have. There's no judgment over there. What's, danger what's dangerous is that if you spend more than you can, afford and then you get into trouble because you suddenly don't realize you're getting you're going to live longer than you did and therefore you don't have enough saved over there so it's important to save first and then look at you know what else can i spend with my discretionary income uh so so you know so it's it's about that freedom to spend when you have enough tucked away because you started investing earlier which is important uh People do spend because they're comparing themselves to others. And I think that's a dangerous thing to do because you, uh, you know, you, you, you have no idea what's the other person's driver. And just because the, uh, your neighbor has a big car, therefore doesn't mean that you also need to have a big car. You've got to ask yourself that question. And, and, and you know, it's different things for different people. For us, we just believe we've been lucky and blessed. So we've been giving away things. Uh, and, I, and I'm a strong believer that when people, you know, people ask, you know, why do you give money? And I wrote this article in for, for Forbes, where we basically said people give because it makes you feel good. And this was based on research done by one of our professors at, at the University of Chicago, John List. 
when he said, you know, people give because it makes you feel good. And whatever you do with your money, do it because it makes you feel good. Because what's the otherwise? It shouldn't be something that makes your life sort of miserable. So Morgan Hazel, as he talks about something interesting over there in his book, he says, it's easier to make money, it's tougher to remain wealthy. And it's because yes. you tend to then spend too much. So that's something to keep in mind here, that you know, you got to hold on to what you've done or make sure that you've not blown it away or lost it in recklessness. So today you see a lot of entrepreneurship coming up and a lot of people being encouraged to be entrepreneurs. And I think it's great, but also they've got to realize that there is also that risk involved and it's not everyone's going to become a unicorn. But, but you know, you, as you said, you know, across, in, in certain places, there's more conspicuous consumption than in others. That's part of the growth. And I also learned that, you know, as, we, as economies get wealthier, as countries become richer, people then start spending on stuff which they didn't do earlier. They'll spend on lifestyle-ish things like theater or, uh, you know, fancy cars, going out to restaurants. When we grew up, I don't know whether you're the same vintage as I am, but uh, you know, we never went out. There weren't many restaurants to go out to when we were young. Yes, yes, we were you're right. But now, I mean, people eat at home as an exception versus the norm, you know, because it's availability also. And, 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 it's, and again, it's nothing right or wrong because those eating out creates jobs, it creates opportunities for other people also. So, so that's really the way I see it. It's, 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 there will be more consumption. People will upgrade what they eat. Even the poor have a right to be want to have a bigger house, have a better uh, mode of transport. All that will happen. Consumption will yes. go on. So also, Louis, I know you've been involved with philanthropic organizations, right? So can you share an instance where one of those uh, has used their limited resources in a really special way so that, you know, the resource allocation has been exceptionally good? Uh, so that we can all learn from that. Well, I think that the biggest lesson that I've learned, well, one of the biggest lessons I've learned from work, being in the social space is really how to spend carefully. And, you know, and, and, and I've tried a lot to get people in the corporate world to engage more with the social sector only to be able to learn how to work and operate in an area of scarce resources. Because then you can realize what waste is here. And, uh, you know, we work with schools in Ladakh at 17,000 feet foundation. And there's not much money around over here to go around, but we've been able to build out through, the, through philanthropy, et cetera, uh, improve the quality of lives in over 200 school, government schools across the state, over the, across the uh, Union Territory. But the other thing also we learn is by hanging out with people who work in the social sector, you understand again how careful they are about their money because they don't have a lot of money. And what you know, why we could spend in a meal uh, one evening could be what they earn in a month. And you know, and, and that you think that makes you think, is it really necessary? I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not saying it's evil, but is it necessary? And uh, so there's a huge amount of lessons. I work with an, uh, another organization called Koro, where we work on grassroots leadership. And during the COVID times, I learned so much about the struggles people had. I'm sitting in this house of ours. We can, you know, arrange for food to be got. We can arrange. I can go to the market next door and get, okay, they understand in line. But we would, we'd have enough. We'd be adequately covered. For them, it was a struggle about how do I get rice? How do I get some dal, etc. You know, and, and pulses, etc. You know, so, so that's when I, you, you, you get to experience the challenges people have. And also, we keep, I keep coming back to the fact, we also appreciate how lucky we are. No, but absolutely. Another, and another set of people that, I, that I've learned how to be cautious about spending is our kids. And, uh, you know, and I'm not extravagant, but through uh, son and daughter, when they, were, you know, when, they, when they were studying in Chicago or working in Chicago, they introduced me to traveling by the bus and by the metro, etc. And actually, it's so much easier to get around. And, uh, and quicker. And, and quicker. quicker. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, so it, it's, it's learning from your kids also. If you give them the right sort of 
environment to go and experiment with that. Yeah. So I, my older daughter is a typical millennial and she will wear her clothes till they tear because she's like, why put pressure on the earth's resources? So I learned so much from that. Yep, yep. My wife gets, my wife is still after my case that I don't get rid of clothes until they really fall in a pocket. She's not happy with that yet. <laughs> um, but also at the Indian School of Public Policy, how is the subject of economic behaviors typically addressed in relation to their impact on policymaking? Well, we, we focus a lot on economics. In fact, one of the criticisms is that a lot of our courses are spending too much emphasis on economics. But that's because we, we believe that it's an important part of public policy. We teach politics, we teach structure of the government, we talk about voting, we talk about all those issues. Uh, but we also teach economics, we teach understanding behavior through the patterns of how people behave in the economic situations. We talk about markets for development, the role of the markets over there. We talk about law and economics, so a lot of the focus is over there because it's very important from a policy perspective. And you know, I'm, I'm sure thanks for asking that. So there are a lot of different tools you've got to understand. You've got to understand critical thinking, design thinking, uh, and then basically get some of the, the tools to work on this, things like statistics, for example. And, and even when now when uh, I run something called the Antaran Leadership Lab over there, and it's about teaching people uh, skills of leadership, but we we do have that underlying thread of economics over here, and the ability to understand the financial implications and costs of public policy. That's important. It's extremely important here because we don't we don't operate in a land of plenty or in a land where there are no sort of there are limited resources here. That's what we operate in. Yes. 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 And tell me, you were talking about mentoring earlier in our conversation. So when you're mentoring young entre entrepreneurs or startups, how do you explain to them the concept of spending personally for their startups, for their target markets? How do you explain that to them? And what do you tell them to do in different scenarios? So, so I'm sure I'm old school. Eh? So, uh, so I'm sort of, I, I'm used to the fact that, you know, you build up businesses by creating cash flows, which uh, for the business. And I realized some years ago that I'm too old for today's world, where it's all about other metrics, which sort of create value over here for people. And, and I struggle with this. So uh, when we looked at, when we, when we were building our HDFC bank, uh, it was about building up a bank that we could all be proud about, which could, you know, show the world that you could have an alternative in terms of efficiency to foreign banks and also the agility compared to the state-owned banks at that time. We never in our wildest dreams expected HDFC Bank to be where it is today. And similarly with IDFC Private Equity, everyone told me, Louis, you can't make money investing in infrastructure. And, uh, and people who know me know that when I'm told I cannot do it, I have to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and we proved it. We sort of created new models for sort of, you know, building our infrastructure and, and developing it. But it was really about, end of the day, how do you keep on generating steady source of income, which means you've got to be careful about cost. So Aditya Puri, we had this great story where Aditya Puri one day uh, said, we will no more give coffee mugs in the office. Bring your own coffee mug. Now it's something which is tiny. It doesn't cost anything. But it sent a signal. It sent a signal about uh, being careful about money. Similarly, the Indian School of Public Policy, we believe that we're building up a school in a frugal way. We've spent a fraction of the money that other people spend, not because we want to be tight-fisted, but we believe that this is a model that is scalable. So being able to control cost is the... So that's why today when I see 
offices with fancy campuses, etc. I'm it's alien to me because that's not the world that I grew up in. As I said, I'm old fashioned here. But but it's really about that. You know, how can you sort of grow a business by being careful about cost is the way that I've grown up thinking about it. Okay. Also from our whole conversation, it seems that you're hugely driven by purpose. So what advice can you give to people who are maybe driven by trends? I mean, I'll give you an example. You're talking about these fancy campuses. At the moment, the startup trend is to give people fancier campuses, to give them all kinds of things in the, in the campus so they don't need to leave it. The arguments of the companies is then they don't need to go home. They get their breakfast, lunch, dinner here. They get their recreation here. They get their haircuts here. They get their dry cleaning here. They don't need to go home. If at all, they'll go home to sleep or they can sleep in the pods at work. So what is your view on that? And also, how would you uh, advise people to move from a trend-driven society to a more purpose-driven society? You forgot to say they give massages also at work. Yes. I mean, there's lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> but there's train know, tracks and there's all <laughs> kinds of things. Yeah. So again, I come back to the fact that, again, I don't create a value judgment for it. It's, it's you know, if it, that's what young people want and that's what your employees want, go do it. But you ask yourself, is it really necessary to build out the business in the long term? But I want to come back to the other thing which you talked about, trends. And, you know, what do you sort of do? I made it a career of doing stuff which was not conventional. And I was told I'm always crazy. I came back to India in 89 when it was not normal to come back to India after studying there. Uh, I quit a foreign bank job with a few of us to set up this strange animal called HDFC Bank, a private sector bank, which again was crazy at that time to, to do. Today, it looks like a no-brainer. Uh, started investing in infrastructure when people said we can't. And then now looking at public policy, which I think really is going to be the next wave of a field to study, like what the MBA was in the past, because it's about the ability to deal with the government. We're going to see a stronger government in our lives. Whether we like it or not is irrelevant. It's going to happen. And how do you deal with the government? How do you get, how does the government get more better policy? So, anyway, so I've done all these things which are, in my view, away from the trend. We didn't set up, for example, another business school. We didn't send up, set up, you know. So, so today when I see people trying to create the next similar thing, I find that to be boring. It may make financial sense, but I find it boring. Uh, so, for example, when you look at ISPP, we have no model which we can say we're trying to copy because there is nothing like what we're trying to make over here. So, it's really creating that path over there, which is what makes it interesting. And that's what I tell entrepreneurs. Can you do something which is, if you want to make money, you can do a lot of me too's, et cetera, and be careful. But if you really want to hit the ball out of the park, you go to stuff which hasn't been done before. And at the same time, don't do it for the money. Do it for purpose. Purpose. And it's, you know, and people have said, you know, fine, it's fine to talk about purpose when you have money. But no. I didn't have money. When I started, I had the distinction of being the lowest paid guy in my graduating class. Uh, for many years after business school, all my friends had gone on fancy holidays. I couldn't. Yeah. I didn't have the money. When, my, when Fiona was defending her PhD, I couldn't go to the U.S. to sort of be there when she, grad, when she defended it and got a graduation certificate because we didn't have the money. Today, we can afford to do that. But at that time, we didn't. So I understand what purpose is. And... Uh, and today, when I, see, when I see a young entrepreneur telling me, you know, Lewis, this business is going to be worth $500 million in this period of time, that person's already lost me. Because my question is, how are you going to make, my question is the more, how will you make this a better world? How will you impact the lives of people? And that's what we've done at the various places we've been at. It's not about the money, it's about creating businesses that will be sustainable and enduring for a long time, and money will come. And that's important, you know, this thing of purpose. I, I have this lovely saying, which I picked up, but it's a quote at the University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business. It's a neon sign which says, why are you here and not somewhere else? 
And I tell everybody, keep asking yourself that question because it helps you understand why am I here? I came for a particular reason. Is that reason still valid? Uh, I'm frustrated, but I didn't, but I knew this was going to happen to me. So maybe I should just focus on some of the earlier things. And I have so many stories over the years about people who, you know, looked at that quote and then said, you know, actually I'm happy where I am. I just been disturbed by either my boss is a jerk or something else, but I actually love the work I do. And sometimes by asking yourself the question, why are you here and not somewhere else? You maybe realize it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. so it also In fact, be, Lewis, yeah? taking your quote to an extreme, I would even say, why are we here on this planet? I'm sure we can do another podcast on that one. That'll take a long, that's a whole different. <laughs> What's I know, I know. But yeah. um, Lewis, we, I, we always do a rapid fire round to summarize our chat. So one way in which you've changed your own spending habits recently and how it helped. I, th I think we, we give away a lot more today. It makes us feel good. The, the ability to give away money is a fab. And when you do it, it's a fabulous feeling. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, what should people think about when they're driven to make purchase decisions? And how can they be reminded to do this? I guess just ask your question, is it necessary? That's a simple question. Is it necessary? Uh, it sounds like a anti-consumerism, but no, I mean, just ask yourself the question, is it really necessary to do so? Okay. And a common spending myth you wish more people would challenge? Buying things make you happy. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lewis, for your time and for your wonderful, powerful insights. Thank you, Anshu. Lovely catching up with you online. Have a good day. Thank you for listening today. I hope you've learned something new, and I hope we brought you a little closer to leading a healthier, happier, more hopeful life. Please do subscribe to my channel on YouTube and on the podcasting channels like Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and Google, and all the other podcasting channels. Also, I would love to hear from you. So please send me any questions that you might have or any topic suggestions to unshu at wellnesscurated.life. See you next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.